Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga review episode. It is Bakukul, New Cult, the 19th. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my review of Brothers Majir by Kevin Stein. I would like to take a moment and thank the DL Saga members and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the link in the description below. You can even pick up Dragonlance Gaming materials using my affiliate links. This is my perspective only. If you have any thoughts or disagree with mine, I welcome you to... Uh, Put them in the live chat if you're watching live or in the comments if you're watching it after the fact. I see some comments already in there, Chris. Thanks. The way these reviews work is I'm going to give you my pre-written review that I wrote while I was actively reading it. So what I usually do is break the book up into thirds. In this particular case, it was about 100-ish pages, like 120 pages each time. So you may see some shift in appreciation or perception that's normal because that's how I read. I go into things with the best of intentions and then I let the <laughs> I let the author ruin my intentions for me or my expectations or or whatever, my appreciation. Uh, this particular novel didn't have that big of a shift. And there's a lot that I liked about it, but there's also a lot that I thought was odd. So we'll get into all of that. I hope you guys are having a great week. Mine was a train wreck. Not just with this hobby of mine, but with real life as well. So let's hope that this makes for a very great beginning to a weekend. I needed that. All right. Got to use these two. Right off the bat, I have to say, it is refreshing to read an author who takes the effort to weave their story into the existing canon. We're introduced to Earwig Lockpicker, who was in Raceland in the Night of Salamnia short story. They reference the Test of the Twins short story, even with Fist and Danilus popping in Raceland's dreams a bit. It really showcases Raceland's weakness and near-death state after the test, which is great. It references the short story where Raceland defeated the Seeker Priest in Lemish and made a nice connection to the Tavern Waitress as her brother was taken in by him. And finally, when they get to Mariclar, the walls are plastered with imagery that has yet to happen in the Legends trilogy, which has already happened in this. It's great. Earwig is a nice Kender stand-in for Tasselhoff Burfoot, and always wants to brawl, which is really entertaining. And Karaman and Raceland are doing their best to get away from him initially before resigning themselves to their fate. Traveling with him. Uh, they travel looking for work. This is immediately after the first short story I referenced. They're broke and find a signpost with a bounty for work in Mariclar. No one has ever heard of this place before, and when they camp for the night, they're actually attacked by masked men. The leader escapes, and everyone else is defeated. They loot the corpses and most of the junk. This I made a note of because no one ever loots corpses anymore. I agree. <laughs> like, playing role-playing games growing up, you you looted every corpse. So when I stopped playing Dragon Warrior or Legend of Zelda on NES as a kid and I went to go play Advanced Dungeons and Dragons at my friend's house, it was normal for me to go, oh, okay, well, I just killed something. Well, what did it have in it? I'd run through its pockets. Like, steal from the dead. Like, that's what you do in Dungeons and Dragons. Nowadays, like the Fifth Age game that I've, I ran for a while, <laughs> I had to almost force people to loot corpses. Because no one ever did. Like, do you have to look for stuff? And then they'd complain that there was no magic items. It's because you're not looking. <laughs> you gotta look. All right. So, and so just all that is to say, I really appreciated that they had the Brothers Majir doing the exact same thing that I do in every role playing game. All right. So they continue on into an inn where the residents are all worried about the cats that have gone missing. The heroes don't know the backstory yet, but apparently Mariclar existed before anyone actually lived there, and it's always been a refuge for cats. The current residents did something to make them disappear, and the residents seem to be led by a woman named Chavez. Now that the heroes are known to be looking for work, and they can't be killed without raising suspicion, they stay at the inn for the night and travel to Mariclar in the morning. Raceland seems to be led by a white line that no one else can see. This actually really bothered me. The way for him to see this white line that's leading him to Mariclar is to take alcohol and burn it into his eye. Like, literally, he does this to Earwig Lockpicker, too, to see if he could see it. So apparently the only way that you can see this white line initially 
or clearly, is to burn your retinas out with alcohol, which is insane and stupid. And why even use that as a, like a, a way to do it? It's just so odd. Yeah. So the guards refuse to let them in to Mariclar until this mysterious person vouches for them at the gate, and then they bust into an inn for the night. Literally bust in. Karaman kicks the door in of this inn, and as soon as they get inside, everything's okay. Like, the innkeeper was just like, oh, yeah, I hated that door anyway. <laughs> like, you're not going to, like, charge them, even mention the broken-ass door? Like, nothing? Not even a comment? And the whole rest of the book, the innkeeper's, like, super stoked about them. They just, he's, like, pissed off at the, um, the, the Kender, justifiably. But as far as the dude who just kicked in his inn door, he's cool with. Makes no sense at all. All right. So the time in Mariclar is equally odd as that intro to Mariclar. They spend a lot of time here before they even get to meet Counselor Chavez. You actually start to wonder, why are they here? Like, they picked up a bounty. Isn't there like a marshal's office or somewhere where they can get more information on this bounty? They don't even look. They're just hanging out. Like, window, literally window shopping and stuff. It's the weirdest, weirdest intro to a book ever. This book is like 340 some odd pages. And this is the shortest, which is one of the longer versions of a Dragonlance novel, if you didn't know. And this is one of the shortest reviews I've ever written. Because nothing actually happened for like 250 pages. Everything that actually happened happened in like all together, like a hundred pages. And that was it. It's so odd of a book. All right. So the time is infused with Raceland having odd dreams and even seemingly getting over his illness from his test. He finally comes to term with the magical effects he's experiencing as they're coming from the night of the eye where the three moons of magic will be aligned. He treats this alignment as if it's only happened once before in his entire life, and that was when he was a child. But if you've ever looked at the actual mapping of the moons, it happens kind of a lot. Like a lot. All the time, in fact. And so you, you have to like sit here and wonder, why is this so rare? Did this, did this author never actually look at the Dragonlance Adventures source book, which had the map of the moons aligning? Like, and the stuff that happens when it aligns, is so out there. Like, the, re the way Raceland comes to terms with, oh, the reason why I am having this weird magical effect of not being uh, hurt by the effects of my test of coughing and hacking and struggling to breathe anymore is because of the night of the eye. The reason why he comes to terms with that is because when he was a child, he started breathing fire like he was a, a, a dragonborn. Like, that's literally a story in this book. He was breathing fire on the Night of the Eye. And, and that was before he ever knew anything about magic. He just happened to breathe fire because the moons aligned. <laughs> what? And it's only happened once. And that one time, suddenly he's like, Aha! It is the Night of the Eye that is causing all of this. I think you're making a few leaps in logic here, author. But okay. So, I did actually enjoy this book, but it is filled with weird, weird things. This happened once when he was a kid, when he breathed fire. So, who knows what will happen this time. He's also being led around by this light that's dissecting the massive walled city. He believes, again, that it has to do with the coming celestial event, and Earwig handles a sextant for Raceland to use to track the moons, I assume. Which is odd, because he just finished the test of high sorcery, so why would he need a sextant to track the moons when he can literally just look up at them and I assume he's given like a pocket <laughs> moon reader chart as a mage of high sorcery at this point? Like, isn't there like some innate knowledge you learn about the tracking of moons once you've taken the test of high sorcery? It seems like there should be, if, at least like a single-sided card you know, just like, oh, well, here are the dates that it will come into alignment or the uh, periods of time that must pass before it comes into alignment again. But apparently not. So, Earwig is being accosted by... And here's the other thing. Oh, dude, I'm just going to tear apart this book. Why do you need a sextant 
it's never referenced again in the book. It It's just sitting on his desk. And you don't need a eyeglass to tell if the moons are in alignment. Just look into the sky. They're moons. You, you see them with your naked eye. You don't need a telescope. What the hell is happening? It makes no sense. All right, I actually don't like this book anymore. This is dumb. So Earwig is being accosted by men who see his necklace and want to take it violently from him, understandably. We even learn that Earwig has been changing his behavior since having found a magical ring in Chavez's room. This, I believe, at the time of writing this, allows Shava to spy on the heroes listening into their conversations. Earwig also gets crazy, insistent about being near the twins at all times until Raislin casts a sleep, casts a sleep spell on him in order to ditch him. And they like just leave him on a park bench. <laughs> the whole, this whole book, they're worried about what's going to happen to Earwig or what has happened to Earwig or where is Earwig. And the one time Earwig is hanging out with him, they cast a sleep spell and abandon his ass on a park bench. So there's no way for them to know how long he's going to be there or what's going to happen to him when he wakes up or what's going to happen to them while he is actively asleep and there are people actively trying to murder him. Total loss in logic. Okay. So they all are met by Chavez and led to her estate. They're, and here's the other thing. Oh, yet another thing. They have the bounty. The whole point is to go to the place that the bounty is being offered and ask for details so that you can complete the bounty. They go to Mariclar, but just start hanging out without ever trying to find out what they have to literally do or how to do or what the terms are or how much they'll be paid or anything until Chavez actually finds them. They're just kicking it at a cafe, drinking some like alcohol chocolate beverage that the author must have tried in some Peru town when he was on adventure, when he was uh, in, in going to college or something. What? Why does the, the counselor of the town have to find you, the bounty hunters? Why don't you find them? All right, don't you want to get paid? It's so weird. All right, so they can immediately sense something magical about her. Raceland can't even see her age like he sees everything else age and die with his eyes. Then he sees this fast glimpse of her as a rotting corpse. That would be my first clue that the attraction that you and your brother are feeling toward this being is magical, you idiot! How can Raceland be at once the most intellectual and intelligent individual we've ever met on literature and... In the next second, the literal stupidest person we've ever met. Me reading this, if I had eyes that saw everyone wither and die in front of me, and I saw one person who didn't, clearly that's magical. And then if I suddenly felt these weird urges in my nether regions, and my brother's doing the same thing for someone that otherwise we wouldn't be having these feelings for, huh, maybe it's magic. Maybe cast dispel magic. <laughs> but no, they just go along with it like, well, she's a little party. I don't understand. I saw Rod and Corpse, but it must be my imagination. So dumb. So dumb. I don't recall at the time of reading this, the outcome of this novel. So I hope she is a lich. Foreshadowing. She seems to have an aura of charm about her, and even Raceland is attracted to her physically. Karaman is entirely under her spell, and even plans to go on a date with her to create a diversion so that Raceland can read her spell books. Weird reason to create a diversion when she does it for them. Everything that they plan, she does for them so they don't have to create the plan. There's no reason for the plan. They didn't even need to get here. She probably just would have taken her carriage out to the road and found them. That's how convenient every happenstance is in this novel. She offers them an obscene amount of steel to find these missing cats. And it's like, I can't remember because I didn't write it down because it was so ridiculous. It's like 25,000 steel to find cats. So ridiculous and over the top, there's no way it's real. And yet they think it's real. And that they're playing coy like they wouldn't do the job for it. Get out of here. So, 
as there's this prophecy of the world ending if these cats leave and the cats are leaving. So everyone here is worried how they have that much steel when people like subsist on one steel a month. I have no idea, but apparently they've been hoarding it. So there's this one black cat that hangs around and I'll, and uh, it'll, I'll return to that shortly. The heroes leave for a night and upon returning the next day, agree to take the case. Chavez has arranged a meeting of the whole council to discuss it with them. The council doesn't want Raceland involved as he's a wizard and wizards aren't trusted in this age. One council member is missing, Lord Mannion, who is murdered by a large cat, seemingly. This causes much fear and concern and leads to even more questions. The next morning, the black cat leads Caraman and Raceland to the sewers and a secret ancient room where all the cats seem to be sleeping. Not dead, sleeping. Once you find out the ending of this book, it makes less sense. Now they need to figure out why and how to reverse this sleeping thing over these cats. And they only have three days to do it until the Night of the Eye Festival, which, if the cats aren't around, the end of the world will come. Of course, it's never stated that literally, and so we're just supposed to guess. And this is the other thing about the novel that has driven me insane since I was reading it and now that I'm thinking about it. Usually with a mystery, with good mysteries, and that's what this book is, it's a mystery, you are led to believe, or you're given clues which are logical that you can then conclude the, the story out of. This doesn't do that. This story, Raislin says he figures it out, and Karaman says, well, I'm glad you figured it out because I have no clue. And that's how we, the reader, are. If you've never read this story for it and you're reading it for the first time, you're literally not given any clues as to the actual final reveal, which defeats the purpose of a mystery. The strength of a mystery is not that you read the detective figuring it out. It's that you're figuring it out with the detective. That's the strength of these types of stories. But they don't do that with this. They literally take a sharp left turn at the very end and then have to explain it all to you in this monologue between the brothers because you never figured it out because they didn't give you the clues to figure it out. It's so aggravating as a reader. All right. So they leave to think and then Karaman is summoned to Chavez where they have a night of pleasure. They, they do it. He sleeps with the lids. He has sex with a dead thing. Dead things, Mikey. Dead things. Raceland is allowed to access Chavez's library, which has a book about Tannis half Elven. Um, one of the books speaks of an ancient mage named Ali Azra, which reminds me immediately of Lovecraft's Necronomicon. He speaks of this city being built by three mages as a gate, but leaves more questions than answers in Raceland's mind in our mind. Then, Race picks up a new book, which is a magical trap that tries to contain his mind. He defeats it with Fist and Dallas's aid and returns home. Meanwhile, Earwig is lured to a bar by a barmaid and abducted, left in a dark cell with other skeletons of former prisoners. This is probably the most confusing point of this entire story. There's no reason for him to have been abducted at all or for who did the abducting. It, it doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't give you any information as to why. There's no reason for it, except for the author to get rid of a kender for a while. That's it. It's so ridiculous and just pointless. All right, so Karaman returns home and finds Raceland, who is still confused, but has a vision of a dark figure in a park. Bad. You can tell it's a bad story writing when they don't even know where they're going to go with the story. And so they just have to create this, well, how do I get character A to get to place B? Well, I can't, I could lead clues or uh, let's just have them have a vision because Raceland's known to have random visions all the time. So why not do another one, right? No, ridiculous. So he, and you can do your own head canon with that saying, well, his mother Rosamond had a bunch of visions and it was said that Raceland took after his mother. And so he must have had visions too. Ipso facto, that's why he had this vision. And I call bullshit because that's your head canon or mine in this particular case, not what's actually in the book. You should not have to make up excuses for a story to make sense. It should just make sense. 
So he takes Karaman to a cafe where they find Bast, the Lord of Cats. Who is Bast? Dunno. Demigod. How do you know he's demigod? Because they tell you he's demigod. He's never referenced ever again or ever before, but we'll just take their word for it. Ba and how, <laughs> how Raceland knows he's a demigod? I don't know, because it's never explained. Bast refuses to answer any questions and then leaves, only to have Raceland and Karaman decide to travel to the old dead wizard's cave outside of town, and Bast reappears, asking to follow them. This is the weirdest setup! At all. So the only reason why they meet this Bast character is because Raisin has a vision of him. And so they go to a cafe, which again is that weird cocoa alcohol mixture cafe. And then Bast comes up to them. And Bast is like, sup dudes, Raisin already knows who I am, don't you Race? He's like, no, I don't. Who are you? You already know. And Raisin already knows what I need to do, don't you Race? And Race is like, no, I have no idea. What are you supposed to do? He's like, you already know. And he's like, well, I'm going to go. See you guys later. And then he takes off. And then they're like, well, I guess we should go look for the only other clue. And that's that there used to be this old evil wizard outside of town that someone tangentially mentioned something about. So let's go check him out to see if maybe there's some clue. And on the way there, Bast is just sitting back against a tree. He's like, hey, where you guys going? And they're like, oh, well, we were just going to go to a... We're just going to go see this old cave. He's like, I'm coming too. Why? Don't know. No reason. Just I'm coming too. Bast is a dick. The whole story long. It's so ridiculous. All right. So they see an ancient lich, which then touches Raceland, throwing him back onto a map. Like this dude has his own battle map that even after his own death... Of, of the city was never destroyed or taken or tampered with or anything. So he's thrown up against this battle map, which implants knowledge into his mind about Mariklar and how it is this sort of ancient gate to the abyss. Yeah, we're going to that old trope again. So Bast has his cats knock out Karaman and then let them go. Bast's motivation makes no sense and nor do the council's motivations at this point. But... You're just supposed to go along with it because it, you're assuming it's going to be a mystery where it's slowly unraveled to you and you can come to terms with what these answers are. Big secret, it doesn't. You're just told at the very end. So Raced goes to Shavas where he comes to and sends Karaman to the inn to find Earwig, who he hears has escaped Bast. Raced confronts Shavas, who says she used Karaman to make Raceland jealous and she wants him to help her kill the Catman as he has killed more of the council. She gives him a wand in order to kill the cat man. Raceland leaves her. Karaman finds Earwig, who lures Karaman into the sewers and attacks him as he's possessed by Tachesis through the ring that he stole from Chavez. Karaman rips the ring from his finger, freeing Earwig. Raceland finds Bass, attacking many council members who propositions him to their side. Raceland refuses to help the council members and helps Bass kill them all. Bast leads Raceland to Karaman and heals Earwig. He then tells them that the Queen of Darkness is being led in through Mariklar tonight during the Night of the Eye, and the three of them must stop it by entering the Abyss's mirror version of this city. The council members were all killed and replaced by demons. So, Karaman and Earwig go to the walls and enter the Abyss city, beating on demons, and Raceland makes a potion of some sort, we're not told until later, I'm getting really tired of Takesis wanting to enter Kryn trope in every damn novel. Um, the evil lich, or like they could have just used the evil lich, Shavas, or the dead wizard, or they could have ancient beings, or demons, or power hungry Irida, or anything. But the one plot point that Dragonlance always uses Takesis has a gate, she's coming through, and you gotta stop her. It makes you wonder why everyone's so surprised in Chronicles when every other story before Chronicles is in the timeline has her doing the exact same thing. So how do they not know that the gods are, are real and returning or gone at all when they're constantly faced by Tachesis trying to come in to the world? And then in Chronicles, they're like, we found no evidence of the gods. No, there's a whole book written about you finding evidence of the gods. What are you talking about? Okay. 
Karaman and Earwig continue to battle demons and meet Bast in the Abyss. There, they're told to find and destroy the altar in the sewers. Bast leaves and they head down, find the altar, open it, and pull out a tube, breaking it as Karaman is being choked out by ghost hands. Raceland visits Chavez, who propositions him, even gets nude, and Raceland outright rejects her. The poison he made attracts magical power, so when she attempts to destroy Raceland for not joining Tachesis, she went to cast a lightning bolt at him, but all the magic swells and kills her instead. When the altered, which is the most interesting version of a poison potion that I've ever heard of, and certainly someone that's third level would definitely know about, when the altar destroyed... Uh, with the altar destroyed and all the demons gone, everything returns to normal. The Kender Earwig leaves with the barmaid, and Karaman and Raceland leave for their next adventure. I have to say, it was a satisfying ending at the time of writing this, but I, it presented some odd ideas. First of all, Dalimar was the drow or dark elf, depending on which version of his Testify Sorcery you read, that Raceland fought in the test. Dalimar. His young apprentice in novels that have already been released. Okay. It's predicted that they would only be five ages to Kryn and that they were in the fourth age. I wonder if that was a throwaway line or if the er uh, editor was seeding possible future game products. I didn't look at the... Well, I do have the date when this was released. Let me take a look really quick. So this was released in 1990. It wasn't until 1996 that Saga System came out. So that's really early for them to be seeding a fifth age of Kryn. Mm, so I don't know, but it is awfully cool that they called it, you know. Anyway, uh, Raceland is weak again, and I wonder if he's relieved of his ailments every night of the eye henceforth, because it's never mentioned again. Why was he able to breathe fire as a kid? Don't know. Who is Ali Azra that they constantly reference throughout the entire novel? I don't know. It's never answered. He's referenced as if we should already know who he is, but as far as I can tell, he's never been mentioned in any other story or game product ever again. So if anyone has any information about this guy, please let me know. I'm curious. Um, and their father chose the name of Majir to honor his favored god. That's not their actual name. He's made it up. He's like, my name is Smith, but I really like that absent god that hasn't been around for 320 years. So I'll just take that as my last name. That, that makes sense. That's what people do. All right. That being said, it was a good read. It did fit into existing canon at the time, and it kept the, uh, the same tired trope of defeating the Dark Queen's machinations. So I would recommend it to fans of Raceland, the Twins, Dragonlance, and general fantasy. It is not required reading for Dragonlance, however, though it does have good elements in it. I actually liked this better writing the review than I do now reading the review that I wrote. There are so many weird plot holes in it, and there's so many ridiculousness in it that it's just frustrating for me now thinking about it. And that's weird. It shouldn't be like that. All right, so Chris says... A uh, really fun uh, read, he thought. The author was definitely familiar with the canon. The characters were true in that way. Not entirely. Uh, favorite line of the book was when women were admiring Karaman and Earwig asked why. Karaman said they've probably never seen a sword this big before. Um, mentioning his, you know, wiener. Uh, did we ever learn what happened to Earwig in later novels? Not that I know of, though I would love to check in with him because he loved a good bar fight or a good brawl, and I appreciate that about a Kender. You don't like these preludes had such earth-shattering events. Wouldn't they have come up in the reunion? Hey, we defeated Tachesis. Oh, yeah? We went through the Moon Lunatary, right? Yeah. We defeated Tachesis, too. Yeah, it totally would have, and it's a huge problem. College Bros Majir, <laughs> Albert Witch, thanks for joining live. How you doing? Engine Joe, how you doing? Uh, they wanted a Kender, but didn't want to use Taz. We got Earwig instead. I didn't mind Earwig. I actually really like Earwig as a Kender character. And I, But I have to be honest. I don't think I've ever read a Kender character because they're all slightly different variations on the Tasselhoff theme. But I've never really met one that was just like, oh, that's a garbage Kender. You know what I mean? Even the ones in um, uh, Dark Disciple trilogy, I thought was really innovative take on a Kender. It wasn't a Tasselhoff clone at all. It was a very emotionally... Um, powerful and manipulative and creative version of, of uh, Kender. I really loved it. 
Hey, first and second edition nerd, how you doing, man? Let's see. Um, you like this book, but Counselor Chavez is a complete transparent villain. Yeah, like she didn't have a mustache, but somehow she was still twirling it. <laughs> didn't make sense. A king's ransom for the kittens. That's right. That's exactly what it was. You asked your, used to ask your cat, do you know where Mariclar is? Well, if she could talk, she would have told you yes, for sure. Race was a big kitty fan, aren't we all? Had one of those kittens hanging from a branch. Posters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hang in there. Uh, History of Dragon. That's a segment on Mariclar City. Yeah, I did a whole video on it. Um, but it never talked about that Azar. Oh, what's his name? Ali Azra. Let's see. Loved it at the time. Early 90s. Hey, Malcolm, how you doing? Uh, you've aged better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have aged better than the novel has. Yeah, so that is uh, kind of my take on this. Is um, While I was reading it, without really being critical, I had a lot of fun reading it, like 100%. There's parts that dragged on, and I was confused until they finally explained everything at the end, because I didn't remember this from when I was a kid. That was <laughs> at least a year ago. And uh, once you get to the end, you're just like, wait a second. Of all of the stuff that I've read about, read about Raislin, this is the most odd and confusing. He is so stupid and yet can do the most amazing things at the exact same time. It makes no logical sense. Hey, Mentor Forge, how you doing, man? Uh, it's actually reading through the series now. Sucks how much the author didn't stick to canon at all. And this, this is, well, here, and here's the big complaint with me. This is the most accurate with canon of a prelude novel we've gotten thus far. The most accurate, because it actually references things that have already happened in reality. But it also makes up a bunch of like weird stuff that's never happened or referenced since. And so it's it's a little column A, a little column B for me. What are you going to do? That's life. You know, these are meant to be just pumped out by TSR to make a buck. And they did. And they were. <laughs> so you can't really... I'm reading Riverwind next. I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about it. That is another one that introduced like proto-Draconians at a time when they should not have been seen or known of by anyone. But then um, uh, the one with Kitiara and Sturm, they fought Draconians too in Karagoth. And they weren't supposed to be around at all there either. So they just are very loosey-goosey with <laughs> stories. I, who cares? I, they're just, just stupid fun, you know? You can't take a serious... It's not, it's not reality. It's a fantasy world, so let's let's get into the fantasy. All right, well, that is it for my review of Brothers Majir by Kevin Stein. What did you think of Bast, the Lord of the Cats? Would you have told Karaman he slept with a lich? <laughs> I totally would have told him. <laughs> uh, was he, I had... No, that's not appropriate for this channel. Never mind. Um, if any of you follow me on any of my other channels, I'll have to tell this story to you. Uh, was Earwig a good replacement for Tasselhoff? And finally, do you mind the beating of Takesis trope in many of these novels? You can email me at info at dlsaga.com or leave a comment below. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell to get notified about upcoming videos, and click the like button. This all goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. And this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful and odd world of Dragonlance. I hope you join in the celebration. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga. Until next time... Slanchevar.